All right, class, welcome to pulmonology, and uh, we're going to, again, we've kind of dealt with this one really heavily because we've dealt with airway and respiration processes already. Uh, we're going to dive a whole lot deeper into it, but uh, again, this first video is going to be about A and P, and so, by the way, there's going to be about 10 videos in all, the time I get through with uh, putting the blood glasses videos in there, so... Um, uh, let everybody hold on here we go this first one we're going to kind of fire through i'm going to tell you we're not going to go deep into it uh in the fact that we've got so many to go through and uh, we need to make sure that we to get the core material out there for you guys uh the biggest thing that our, our respiratory system does of course is brings oxygen in removes carbon dioxide and i think a lot of people forget the second part it removes carbon dioxide which is what is the triggering mechanism for most of our available processes as far as breathing. When our carbon dioxide goes high, most of the time, that's when we start to breathe faster. Uh, and when our cells get distressed, again, we breathe faster. Respiratory rate, I think, is one of the biggest indicators of how your patient's doing. If they're breathing fast, we got a problem, okay? Uh, it's somewhere around something it something's going on that's causing a problem when you've got an elevated respiratory rate okay uh and again uh again there's some intrinsic risk factors again uh influenced by who you are and but from what the patient genetic predispositions can play a factor in this but a lot of times there's a lot of respiratory conditions that that have worsening effects due to cardiovascular or circulatory problems okay and although those two systems, and you got to remember, those two systems are very interconnected, extremely interconnected. And the patient's level of stress can also increase the severity of a respiratory complaint. So again, they can have difficulty breathing for a variety of reasons, okay? Uh, there's external factors that also influence it, which is, of course, uh, 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 smoking, uh, being around a bunch of dust particles and not taking proper respiratory infection. Uh, in the world of COVID that we live in now, again, uh, disease factors, again, breathing in, being subjected to additional diseases, all right? So, again, probably one of the most important factors is cigarette smoking. And, again, it although it is on the decline in the United States, it is still a factor, okay? The smoking is a multi-billion dollar industry, and, again, their job is to, you know, sell cigarettes, but, unfortunately, those have really bad uh influences to the patients and don't forget about the environmental pollutants um not so much nowadays because we're a little bit more aware but like your coal miners uh where or, or people that work with asbestos back uh you know 40 50 years ago they're now reaching the age where we're having to deal with these workers that were exposed to dust particles for an extremely long period of time um firefighters for that matter again 20 years ago, we went in without an air pack. You know, actually, this was about 30 years ago. We would go in without an air pack. Why? Because that's how we fight fire. And nowadays, again, 20 years ago, we would throw the the, the MSA off. we throw our air mask off because it was too hot to work in. And nowadays, again, when you're doing overhaul, probably very important to make sure because you're still off-gassing material and you can start absorbing this. We've seen such a high rate of cancers you know, and it's because of that constant exposure to carcinogens, okay? And the number one way into our carcin our body, again, is to breathe them, all right? So, again, your upper airway, it is responsible. You come in through the nose. Uh, it's responsible for, um, again, warming, humidifying it. Uh, it can go directly through the mouth. However, you don't get that warming process. So, again, that's when you breathe in that cold air and you're feeling it back there. Not too much a problem in Florida, but when we're talking other places, uh, you can actually get a lot of drying of this of this general area of the mucosa. Again, goes down into the to the trachea. At that point, splits off at the carina to the bronchi, the left of main stem bronchi, into the bronchioles, and then into, again, the lung tissue where it actually goes to the alveoli, where there is where the air exchange actually occurs. Uh, oxygen is put onto the bloodstream, carbon dioxide is removed, you breathe it back out. Okay, again, your diaphragm is your major muscle for doing that. It's controlled by the phrenic nerve. Uh, again, and remember, if in trauma, if you break that phrenic nerve, they don't breathe anymore. Okay, so 
Uh, again, we've just talked about all those lonely things. Now, remember that you've got a lot of mucus in those areas. Uh, for those of you that have ever had a sinus infection, you will attest to that. But the cilia also are the, the thinner, like uh, finger-like projections that uh, contract in a single direction, and they help clear that uh, particles and then clears if it has mucus there. It also helps clear that music. Uh, mucus uh, uh, it comes up with a hocken, and there you go. And and again, you can either sw you swallow it, hopefully not, but then or you, you can just spit it out, or or they you cough it out essentially. Okay. Uh, we're very familiar with all of these structures. I can tell you that right now, especially, again, your vallecula, your epiglottis. Uh, remember that these can swell, especially in our, our, I would say the children, but, but nowadays we're getting adult cases of epiglottitis. So something, to, or as a matter of fact, for that matter, esophagitis or tracheitis, we're actually getting cases of those where those actually, infect, and again, you're going to have difficulty breathing with these patients. All right. So again, our upper airway, uh, again, the nose and cilia, they, they, they help r r remove trapped particles. It's kind of your first line of defense. Uh, your chisal box plexus, okay, it's in the lower nasal septum, and that's where you warm your air. Um, again, those are the, those turbinates in the back of the throat that, that, again, help warm the system. Your paranasal sinuses, uh, they're in the, the front part of the skull. Uh, and, and they have to do with um, the, the maintaining the pressure and the balance uh, of your body. Uh, the superior portion of the nose contains nerve fibers, of course, with the, with your olfactory senses, which is your uh, cranial nerve one, which goes back again to your sense of smell. All right. So again, these are these are kind of uh, production areas: our frontal sinuses, side sinuses, and of course, when they get infected, of course, they like to drain a whole lot. And, of course, it just makes us pretty much feel miserable. Uh, your pharynx, again, is the funnel-shaped structure that uh, goes back. It's the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. Uh, we get to see those quite a bit. And, again, uh, when you get the swelling of any of these areas, of course, it can be a problem. Uh, when swallowing epiglottitis, will tip backwards, and it will... Um, and the cartilage pairs close and diverts the food into the esophagus. So, again, it's got a very important function. Uh, again, your trachea is about 11 centimeters in length. It's uh, C-shaped cartilage rings. The rings do not go all the way around. It's supported in the back by the spine. Uh, that's why you don't have it in the, all the way around. And, and again, it, this uh, stimulation for food or other ingested products triggers a coughing reflex. So if it does go down the wrong pipe, guys, your body knows to <coughs> do that number. Okay? It knows to do that. So your lower airway, again, the carina will break off the line, left and right main stems. Again, we like the right main stem a lot because the right main stem is usually where, if you put the ET tube in too far, it, it's where it goes usually. Um, again, they start to, to divide into secular bronchi, and then it goes into bronchioles, and then your small airways, and then back up into the alveoli. Uh, your bronchioles become terminal bronchioles. And again, the terminal bronchioles is where you're, again, it was the it divided into respiratory bronchioles. And that's where your airway shifts from an air to organ of gas exchange. So the gas exchanges, again, happen way deep in. Okay, way, way, way deep in. All right. Now, the problem with our breathing problems are is that if any of these kind of get swollen or filled with mucus and then get swollen, again, going to cause major problems. Okay, uh, for us. Uh, again, the the lower uh, anatomy there again is your um again, we've got about three million alveoli in your lungs and most of those gas exchange. Um, they go flat all the time. Okay, we constantly reinflate them. That's why we love PEEP so much because PEEP is what helps maintain the inflation of those. When you, matter of fact, uh, you will probably auto PEEP yourself probably one to two times a minute just to reopen alveoli. Okay. Um, when we're talking about a collapsed lung or we're talking about uh, a kid not exchanging air good, that's why we go in there and we might have somebody on a ventilator for 20, 30 minutes before we even begin to think about transporting them just to recruit alveoli. So that process, again, very important when we do that. All right, a little video here on the gas exchange. Maybe not. Maybe here, maybe not. There, let's try here. There we go. Do 
done. You know, when you test it, it doesn't do this. Yeah. There we go. Lungs are infoldings of the body surface that are used for gas exchange. The lungs of mammals are divided into tiny sacs called alveoli. Deoxygenated blood flows through the capillaries that cover each alveolus. When air enters the respiratory tract and reaches an alveolus, oxygen diffuses across the respiratory surfaces. The blood is now oxygenated as it leaves the surrounding capillaries. The alveolus functions as an interface between air and blood. That interface consists of a layer of epithelial cells, some extracellular fluid, and the wall of a capillary. The capillary wall is so thin that oxygen and carbon dioxide readily cross it. The bloodstream distributes the oxygen from the lungs to the tissues that need it. The bloodstream also delivers the carbon dioxide from the tissues that generated this waste product to the lungs for expulsion. So it's really important to understand about that. And more importantly, that's why the recruitment of alveoli and, and reinflating those lungs and keeping those lung sacs open. Again, we can lose a certain amount of it and still be okay. But if we've lost a whole bunch of them or there's a disease process with that lung where they no longer exchange gas, that's why that becomes even more important. Okay, especially when you lose that ability to exchange air and, and, and gas. All right, uh, let's see. Let's keep moving on here. We talked about this. Remember that it's not only your air sacs are held, but they've got elastin fibers, capillaries. Uh, we start talking about your disease processes, COPD especially. Uh, a lot of these elastin fibers is what's actually going to break down. Uh, a lot of times these smooth muscle, by the way, constrict the airway, especially in your anaphylactic or your asthmatic uh, patients. And again, a lot of the drugs that we work on to focus to open these things up when they get inflamed is so very important. will actually cause these to relax. We want that to happen, actually. Now, again, the, the, remember your pulmonary capillaries, they have the carry the carbon dioxide rich from the heart into the lungs. That's where your gas exchange. And then the alveolar lining, remember. And remember, if that alveolar lining gets thicker, than the one cell that it needs to be if it gets a layer of mucus around it. Again, things that we could cause some major problems, okay? And you got to remember that there are uh, uh, alveolar macrophages in their white blood cells, basically, and they, they, they digest particles, bacteria, or other things. Uh, remember that if you've got a weakened immune system, you're more prone to getting an infection in the lung, pneumonia. And uh, we, we have to understand that process and how those things are kind of interconnected. Um, your lungs are, are again, the, the organs of respirations. It's covered by the connective tissue, which are your pleura, uh, a visceral and a parietal pleura, okay? Um, and then the, the pleural fluid, it, it serves as a lubricant. And again, talking about pneumonia, usually what happens is, is that pleural fluid goes away and it causes that rubbing uh, uh, thing. And again, a very painful inspiration, expiration, all right? Uh, again, the blood is supplied to the lungs, by the way, uh, pulmonary vessels and bronchial vessels. They don't get their blood supply from the pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins. They actually have their own blood supply that comes off of uh, the, the, the aorta, actually, that comes off of that. All right. Uh, again, the pulmonary arteries, they transport deoxygenated blood. Carbon dioxide is uh, oxygen-rich blood. And then the pulmonary veins transported oxygenated blood back to the heart. We've kind of studied that uh, in in huge amounts of, of, of detail. Again, ventilation is the mechanical process of moving air in and out of the lungs, okay? Not to be confused with respiration, which is the gas exchanges, okay? But you have a, an alveolar uh, respiration and you've got a cellular respiration, okay? And, and it's very important to understand that and understand the differences between those. Uh, again, remember, ventilation has two phases, inspiration and expiration. Uh, we got to draw air in, but remember that the air's got to come out. And remember that when we ventilate a patient, we're kind of doing the exact opposite of normal, okay? And it's very, un we, we again have to understand that, that, that we are causing, we, we can cause some problems by doing that. We, we actually fix a lot more by doing it, but remember that it's opposite of what we normally do, okay? 
And again, especially when we're talking about when we had an obstructive process going on in the lungs, or, or worse yet, we've got a pneumothorax of some sort, us doing that can actually cause greater problems, all right? Uh, remember that normally uh, inspiration, uh, again, it, it's when is a active process when the diaphragm goes down. Your expiration is a very passive process, does not require en energy, which is why, by the way, when they quit breathing, it looks like that they're breathing, but they're not really breathing because basically um, everything, the power is out and the air just keeps going out. All right. It just keeps going out. It, it, everything relaxes. The air is going to come out on you. All right. Um, again, the more airway resistance or the drag to the airflow, the less air flows into the chest cavity. So we got mucus in the airway. We have uh, problems with our turbinates. Again, it's going to decrease lung volume. Okay. That total lung volume. And then remember, if we lose lung volume, guys, we lose that alveolar staying open. And again, the alveoli start to partially collapse, all right? And that is, again, a bad thing, all right? So lung compliance is the ease in which the chest expands. Uh, usually this is not a problem for us, but in our patients that have a disease process, asthma, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, ARDS, uh, COVID, they, they, again, it, it changes the lung compliance, okay? And it, and it requires additional pressure, which, again, leads to additional problems, okay? Um, the volume varies in the lungs based upon metabolic needs, but most of the time, uh, quiet respirations is about 500 milliliters of air, uh, or 7 mLs per kilogram, is kind of your, is what we've always been using. Uh, but in the normal person, it's usually around 500 mLs, okay? Our standard bag, by the way, is 1,500. So if you're cranking down on a standard bag for the little old granny who weighs 70 kilos, you're probably giving her too much air, okay? Um, your inspiratory reserve is the log draw. It draws upon additional volume of air besides the air uh, being required during a quiet respiration. In other words, it's taking a deeper breath, all right? Expiratory reserve volume is the amount of the air that can be forcibly expired. Uh, for us firefighters, uh, remember that um, this is what we actually test you on when you're blowing through that little tube at the hospital. Or is your, and we tell you to keep going, keep going, keep, keep going. And the reason they tell you to keep going like that is because they're actually testing the expiratory reserve volume that you have. Your residual volume is the air that remains in the air in the lung at all times, and that's what helps maintain the alveolar patency. Okay, and especially when you're talking about collapsing air, air we've got to really watch out for that. Uh, inspiratory capacity, again, is the sum of the total tidal volume and the inspiratory return volume. Uh, again, these are all measurements that we talked about with the ventilators. Okay, uh, vital capacity, the amount of air that's measured in a full inspiration. And the total lung capacity is the total volume of the air that's in the lungs at any one time. Uh, the reason that you're going to see you're going to see TC a lot on your or VC a lot TC a lot on your ventilators, okay? So you got to watch out for these guys. Uh, minute respiratory volume is the amount of air that's moved in one minute, and again, it's more of a ventilator setting. Uh, your minute air volume is the all going through the alveoli in one minute. Remember, we got about 150 milliliters of dead air space, okay? And then the forced expiratory volume is the volume of the hail exerted over a period of time. Let's see here. Anatomical dead space, which we just talked about that. Uh, and then, then you got the alveolar dead space. So some of the alveol the air still stays in the alveoli, even though we force it out as hard as we can. Uh, peak flow, by the way, measures the air flow during a forced expiration. The reason that I bring that up is because you guys probably saw that a lot with your uh, COPD or your asthma patients. They measure that with the spirometer, making sure that, again, that they're actually able to put out a good amount of volume, okay? Um, again, your um, your brainstem is what controls it, it through the, again, the, and the, sends the signal down through the phrenic nerve to the intercostal nerves that activate the diaphragm that causes it, the actual movement to happen. And remember that these sensors, guys, are actually geared more towards carbon dioxide levels, arterial carbon dioxide levels, okay? 
And then again, stretch receptors provide input to the medullary center, which prevents that overinflation of the lungs. They love to throw Hewing Brewer's reflex in there on your uh, National Registry test. That's the one that says, hey, it doesn't, um, that won't allow you just to keep sucking air in, okay? So at some point, the, your medulla says, we're not going to do that, okay? But again, it's off of carbon dioxide levels, okay? The biggest thing I'm on this slide here, okay? So by the way, and, and if you have an increase of arterial PCO2, what happens is, is it lowers your pH. And when you lowers your pH, again, your blood becomes more acidic. So your body breathes faster in a response to maintain the balance, okay? And we're going to talk about that balance a whole lot. We're talking about, we're going to start talking about ABGs and how that it maintains that balance, okay? It is one of the major systems that helps maintain your acid base balance within your body, okay? Uh, here's the problem. Uh, patients with COPD, uh, they're less responsive to the changes of PCO2. Therefore, they switch more to uh, if I've got a low oxygen drive or your hypoxic drive versus a, a CO2 or a hypercapnic drive, okay? So the high CO2 levels, normal people, in patients with COPD, it actually switches to uh, it actually will switch to a, a low level of oxygen in there. Uh, diffusion is the gas between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries. Uh, then oxygen moves from the oxygen-rich alveoli into the oxygen-poor capillaries. And then uh, the carbon dioxide passes out uh, through the carbon dioxide that is expelled. We've talked about that in great lengths, okay? Um problem with lung diffusion though guys um remember that the patient with high concentrations of oxygen okay but you've got medicines that can also interfere with that as well okay and uh diuretic agents anti-inflammatories uh they help reduce inflammation yeah that's great but they also kind of interfere with that lung diffusion process as well just remember that with lung diffusion it's got to have three things in order to make it truly work uh, an adequate blood volume, an intact pulmonary capillaries, and an effective pump pumping through the heart. If you don't have all three of those, you're going to have problems with the respiratory system, and it's just not going to work as it's supposed to, okay? And let's take that from, a, again, most people with, uh, we're going to use COVID as the example here, but with an infectious, any type of lung disease process, even though you're getting good air in and out, they don't exchange it properly at the capillary level. Again, it's going to throw the whole system off kilter. Um, we talked about this already. Oxyhemoglobin is, again, oxygen that is bound. Uh, hemoglobin with oxygen bound. Deoxyhemoglobin. And the reason why, because guys, remember, our pulse ox actually measures oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin. Okay. And again, there it has hemoglobin has four of the the iron containing heme molecules, and they'll they'll start to lose those. But changes in, in again, fever, blood pH, CO two can alter that oxygen dissociation curve. Uh, and I'm going to do actually a, an entire video on that oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the old two three GPG, DPGs. We're going to talk about all of those things during that video. Okay. Um, now, carbon dioxide is, again, is, is transported to the lung. is usually is a bicarbonate ion. Uh, there is a little bit dissolved in plasma, and there's some of it that's actually bound to the hemoglobin molecule, but not as much as you think. Most of it is the bicarbonate ion, okay? HCO3 is how it's transported. It's a very weak acid. When it gets back to the lung, it breaks down into carbon dioxide and water, and boom, there you go. The, the carbon dioxide releases, all right? So again, most of the, the carbon dioxide transported is the bicarbonate ion. I guess if it's in there twice in the slides, you bet it's probably going to see it at least one time on the desk. All right. So remember that in the lungs, the reverse takes place with the water and carbon dioxide. Okay. So remember that that's how it gets rid of it. Now, carboxymonohemoglobin, again, is uh, you got hemoglobin with carbon dioxide bound. Uh, it creates a Haldine effect, which is the heme portion of the blood molecule becomes saturated with oxygen and becomes acidic because of that, okay? And that and again, this is one of the problems that we have with a shift in um, 
where they the blood becomes acidic is this Haldine effect starts to get affected, which decreases the amount of oxygen that can actually be carried by the bloodstream, okay? So only a fraction of the carbon dioxide is actually transported as a gas, okay? Most of the time it binds either to this or it will bind to a water molecule to form that weak carbonic acid to take the HCO3 molecule to take it back, all right? And uh, perfusion to take place, again, it requires an adequate blood volume, all right? We got to have that in order to get everything going through. And you got to have the heart that's actually pumping the blood effectively in order to get it to go through there. Um, again, to maintain perfusion, you've got to ensure that the patient has adequate circulating volume to improve the pumping action of the heart. Again, pulmonary respiration occurs actually at the lungs. Cellular respiration, uh, I called it alveolar respiration earlier, but pulmonary respiration is another term for it. Cellular respiration, again, is it occurs in the peripheral capillaries, okay? So, again, that's where your gas exchange happens there. All right, the good news is we've come to the end of this, but we're also about to talk about that lovely oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. I might be putting another video up on Edpuzzle to talk about the, uh, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve because I do think that it is very important that you guys understand the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Yes, I'm, I'm going all Jesse on you guys. But that's the end of the first one, and I'll see you guys on the next one.